When I was thinking on this half-truth sermon series, um, I had on my mind just four phrases um, that I wanted to teach on. The everything happens for a reason, God won't give you more than you can handle, God helps those who help themselves, and love the sinner, hate the sin. That was my plan. And then after the first week, this old farmer, Steve Ruby from Path Valley, asked an excellent question. Is karma in the Bible? Now, I love that he was thinking about that even after the very first week, because we should be thinking about the things that we're saying and the, and the ways that we think. Is, is this biblical? So I appreciate it so much. If you don't appreciate it after today, you can talk, talk to Steve. <laughs> But you know, it, it absolutely falls into the half-truth category because part of the meaning of this word is biblical and part of it is not. Uh, we need a lot of prayer for this one, so let's pray. Merciful God, help us. Help us to learn. Help us want to learn. Help us want to learn your truth so that we may walk in your way and reflect the fullness of life that you died to give us. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations, the thoughts of all of our minds and hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O God. May they rise up to you as true worship as we study your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As one of you was going out the door last week, I mentioned to this person that we were going to look at um, whether... Uh, karma was biblical or not, and this person said, you know, that'll be interesting because I've always thought that I had bad karma in my life, which is not the first time that I've heard any of, some of you uh, say the word karma in a variety of contexts. So let's look first at the definition of karma. It comes from the ancient language of Hinduism called Sanskrit, meaning act or action or word. The law of karma teaches very simply what goes around comes around or you'll get what's coming to you. It's it's a notion that all thoughts and words and actions begin a chain of cause and effect and that we will personally experience the effects of everything that we cause. Which should sound to you very familiar in the words of Galatians 6 from the Apostle Paul. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We reap what we sow. That's the law of karma, and that's the half of this phrase that's based on biblical truth. Let's just unpack it just a little bit more. If I have a pack of cucumber seeds and I plant a seed, I do not expect that I'm going to get a tomato from that seed. If I have a watermelon seed, I'm not going to expect that after a period of time I'm going to get a green pepper from that particular seed. What I plant, I harvest. So if I plant kindness into the world, I will receive kindness back. Now some of you may hear that and say, well, I don't know, sometimes I don't. Well, you know what? If we keep planting kindness, if we keep planting kindness, just like a farmer has to be patient to see what's going to grow from what he plants, eventually we will reap kindness. If we plant impatience and and frustration, then we will receive impatience and frustration back. And I think this truth of reaping and sowing is something that that deserves a little more, more thinking. I mean, for instance, in your life, if you have trouble making and keeping friends, If that's just something that keeps repeating a pattern in your life, then maybe you should stand back and take a look. What kind of a friend am I? Okay? Am I a friend that is trustworthy? Am I a friend um, that doesn't want to be your friend for what I can get out of it? You have to, to think about this. 
reaping and sowing. If you're someone who's constantly getting into arguments, maybe it's because you're sowing discord all the time. You're sort of looking for a fight, although you may not realize that you are doing it. If we're reaping something in our life over and over and over again, that's not good. That's not good. We need to take an honest look at what we are sowing. That makes sense, right? We reap what we sow. We harvest what we plant. So does that make karma biblical? Well, let's go a little further. The goal of Hinduism, which is where we get the word karma from, the goal of Hinduism is divine perfection and full integration which equals a rejoining of our body's positive energy into the energy of the cosmos. And so the end result for a person in Hinduism, the end goal result for that person is perfect nothingness, that we become a positive, a speck of positive energy in the universe. That's the goal. And according to the teaching, it takes the average person many, many, many lifetimes to reach divine perfection or full integration, sort of a swallowing up. And the truth about the law of karma in its origins really is um, the way that you live this life determines uh, the quality of your next life. So if you're unselfish and kind, or if you are unselfish and kind and holy during this life, then you'll probably get a pleasant ride the second time when you are being reincarnated, being reborn into an earthly body. However, if you live a life of selfishness and evil, then you, when you are reincarnated, you will be in a less than pleasant living lifestyle. In other words, you reap in the next life what you are sowing in this life. And so some people who have a lot of troubles in this life um, blame bad karma. They say, well, I must not have lived a very good life last time. I must not have been very good, so I'm suffering the consequences now. Are you starting to get a little uncomfortable, brothers and sisters? You should be. Christians don't believe in reincarnation. We believe in resurrection. Not reincarnation. Resurrection. Have I heard Christians say things about their past lives or maybe make suggestions about what they might want to be in their next life? Yes. Are they joking? Probably. Maybe. I don't know. Does it bother me? Yes. It bothers me. And it should bother anybody who calls themselves a Christian because nowhere in the Bible are we taught that we get more than this one's life, this one life. And there's so much spiritual confusion out there anymore. Why would we want to add to it, even in a joking manner? Now, some people who want to mix and match beliefs from a variety of religions to make sort of a designer belief system for themselves point to the scriptures about the prophet Elijah and John the Baptist as being one and the same. They point to that one as sort of their proof about reincarnation. Let's take a look at it. This is Luke 117. And he, John the Baptist, will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. So they take that and they think that that means reincarnation in the spirit and power of Elijah. But listen to what happened when John himself was asked if he was Elijah. This is in John 1. And just we'll just look at the ones, the next one down. Um, can we go to the next scripture then? Yeah, there we go. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. No, no means no. Others point to the scripture when the disciples asked Jesus um, about the man who had been born blind, if he, um, as proof of 
um, reincarnate as proof that they believed in reincarnation. Um, and so they asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, you know, did he live a, a bad life, a negative heartache sort of life, the life the last time? And so he, his consequences, he's born blind in this life. And Jesus' answer said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God would be displayed in his life. So, shot that down. I've heard people say about children or youth, he or she is an old soul. Have you heard that? Listen. What you're indirectly saying when you say that statement is that this child has been through many reincarnations and has a wisdom beyond their chronological years. Well, some children do have a wisdom beyond their years, but it's not because they're on the tenth time around. It's because God has given them supernatural wisdom. You read the, read the Bible. There's young people all over the Bible who have incredible wisdom. Sometimes I hear people use the notion of karma as a point of revenge. Karma's going to get you, right? Karma's going to bite you. Well, if we're talking about reaping and sowing, well, that's true. I mean, we do reap what we sow. And if we're going to sow gossip about others, then we're going to get gossip back. If we sow ill will towards others, we're going to get ill will back. But karma, folks, is not a Christian belief. It arises from the Eastern religions and practices that includes belief in reincarnation until a person finally gets everything right and becomes a speck of energy in the universe. It is important that we know what we believe. And to remain theologically consistent, a Christian must dismiss the theory of karma, which includes reincarnation, or dismiss Christianity altogether. To mix and match terms from other religions just because you always have, just because you sort of like that particular part from that one, is to do an incredible disservice to our Lord and what he died to give us. Graduates, you are going to get hit hard wherever you go next with opportunities and temptations to toss aside the truths that you have been taught in the church. You're going to be called old-fashioned, stupid, weak, brainwashed, if you take a stand for your historical biblical faith. I'm sure it's probably already happened to you. In fact, it's happened to any of us who are committed to living the life as Jesus Christ calls us to live. But listen with me to these wonderful, ancient, time-tested words from 1 Peter 3. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. That's sowing and reaping. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now, it's no mere coincidence that before this passage in Galatians 6 that talks about sowing and reaping, the Apostle Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. If that's what we're sowing, even towards people whom, with whom we disagree, who may be hurling insults at us, who may try to turn others against us because of what we believe, if we just keep sowing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that's what we're going to reap. That's what we're going to harvest. Listen to these words from Jesus in Luke 6. 
Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is not karma. This is learning to live and love like Jesus. This is discipleship. This is discipleship. But let's be crystal clear what the Bible says about dying. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28 declares that just as people are destined to die, yes, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed to take away the sins of many. We die physically once. One time, and after that we face judgment. We are born once physically, and we die once physically. One life, that's all we get. But there is another birth and death that we must consider. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, We all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. Jesus tells us that we need to be born again spiritually, by water and by the Spirit, by baptism and by the coming and filling of the Holy Spirit. That's not a reincarnation, that's a rebirth in the very same body. With the Holy Spirit then taking control, taking, taking control of the reins of your life. It might look like you've been taken over by somebody else to your family when all of a sudden you start exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit instead of some other things, but it's not a reincarnation, it's a rebirth. It's a rebirth, it's a woo-hoo! It's a being freed from the chains that have, that have bound you up for so long. Being freed from the, from the sowing and reaping of the sins of the flesh. And look at what they are. And this comes before the fruit of the Spirit. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. Who here has not sinned in any of those ways? Please raise your hand. Right. Okay? None of us. None of us. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Even babies have fits of rage when they're hungry, right? We are born into sin. We are born into sin. And I'm telling you, dying and getting into somebody else's body is not going to fix it. It's not going to fix it. Only Jesus, the Lamb of God, can fix our sin problem, can fix the fact that you know, he came to destroy the works of the devil. And what are the works of the devil? To keep us enslaved to sinning, keep us enslaved from, to sinning so that we would not enter into a life-giving relationship with our Creator, with our Creator God. Jesus is the only one who can fix this sin problem for us. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation, destruction and separation from God. And Jesus paid the price for us. He completely paid the wages for us. And so if we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, then the Holy Spirit comes to us in that very moment and begins to, to do something inside of us so that we, we begin to yearn and desire to exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's a rebirth that one day leads to an eternal resurrection. Amen? Amen. About a month ago, when we thought that 
Joanne Shoup was not long for this world. When she was in the hospital one day, I had just some time alone with her. And I said to her, one day, when you take your last breath here, the very next breath that you take, you're going to take that breath in the presence of your Lord. And when he looks at you, Joanne, he is not going to see all the sins that you've committed. He is not going to see the sins that you have committed against him and against others. He is going to see when he looks at you the righteous robes of Jesus Christ that were placed on you the moment that you put your faith in him. He's going to look at you and he's going to see those shining white righteous robes and he's going to look at you and he's going to open his arms and he's going to say, Welcome home! And she, laying there in that bed, her eyes started to tear up and she just looked beautific and she said, Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Jesus said that he would go and prepare a place for us so that where he is, we can be also. He said to the thief beside him on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. And when you read the book of Revelation, the visions that John saw and recorded in the book of Revelation, you know what? There are people around the throne of God, not specks of energy. There are people around the throne of God, people who are not crying anymore, people who are not sick anymore, people who are not grieving anymore, people who are in pain no more, individual people whom we will recognize this morning, right before Winnie died, her eyes opened wide and she said, Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. People that we will recognize and people who will recognize us, people that we will celebrate with for all eternity. Kick the word karma right out of your vocabulary, brothers and sisters. It is Jesus Christ who makes all things new. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now we are going to sing some songs about heaven now. Think about how God worked this out. We're going to sing some